I'm Elizabeth Curry Chandler. I'm a journalist and writer who, together with my husband Otis, founded the website Goodreads, an endeavor which completely took over our lives. Today, I'm editor in chief of Goodreads, and I'm still doing what I've always loved to do interviewing and writing about creative and dynamic people. For this podcast, I get the world's most interesting people to tell me about the books that have shaped their lives. Support for Books of Your Life comes from Audible. Enjoy audiobooks anytime, anywhere with the free Audible app. Your first book is free when you start a 30-day trial. So why not check it out? Visit audible.com slash goodreads or text goodreads to 500-500. Marlon James has been writing since he was a child in Jamaica. It took over 70 rejections, but when his first novel finally found a publisher, Marlon James made his way to America. He's now an esteemed member of the literary community. In 2015, his novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, won the Man Booker Prize, the first Jamaican ever to win that prestigious award. Now he's turned to epic fantasy. Black Leopard, Red Wolf is gaining great traction on Goodreads. Marlon James joined me at the Goodreads offices to talk about his latest book and about three books that have changed his life. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Absolutely. So first, let's talk a little bit about Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Mm -hmm. It's the first volume in the planned Dark Star trilogy, a saga that pays homage to African history and mythology. In it, a band of mercenaries, including a witch, a talking buffalo, a giant, a shapeshifter, and a bounty hunter named Tracker, are hired to find a lost boy with a mysterious significance to a king. Goodreads members are going crazy for this book. Mm. More than 50,000 have said they plan to read it. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And um, even I I pulled a reviewer who's been on our site for a long time, Ron Charles. Mm. He said, stand aside, Beowulf. There's a new epic hero (laughs) slashing his way into our hearts, and we may never get all the blood off our hands. (laughs) Please tell me why you shifted from traditional literary fiction Mm -hmm. to epic fantasy. I think for me, it wasn't much of a shift um, for two reasons. One, because I read so widely and I read pretty much anything anybody put in front of me. I've always sort of read from all these genres and I've always drawn from them. There are lines in Brief History that that could not have happened if I hadn't read sci-fi and some of that would not happen if I hadn't read Toni Morrison or, or Salman Rushdie or, or Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So in, it, for me, it's not so much of a leap, especially since you know my last novel, which I guess is the closest I came to writing realistic fiction, is still, part of it is still narrated by a ghost. It also is, I, guess, I think the second reason why it's not much of a leap is I just, I don't know, I always felt I was on my way to telling this kind of story. And I can only speak for myself and a lot of the writers I know that eventually, if you're going to tell stories, you're going to come back to original stories, which is a lot easier if you're descended from Europeans because they're all there, whether it's the Icelandic sagas or Grimm's fairy tales or so on. For the, the, the person in the African diaspora, it's a little hard, though. It's not to, say the, not to say the stories aren't there. They are. But it says something that I still had to research almost all of this, even though I knew eventually I was going to go back to the myths and try to tell a story from that. It is really satisfying, I think, in a way to go back Mm -hmm. to those primal stories Mm -hmm. that I noticed that you said that before you write a book, you always read the Greek tragedies. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading all the Greek mythology to my kids Mm -hmm. because And part of it is purely selfish. I want to be more familiar with those. And when I read them, Mm -hmm. I think it informs other books that you've read. Um, Part of it. But but the challenge for me, though, with that is that it's informed so much of what I read. But I want to write a book that is not driven from European mythologies and European histories. So I knew I had to almost de-Westernize myself. Not fully. I'm still a I'm still a kid in the West. I still grew up. I'm, I speak English. You know, I like comic books. It's still hugely inspired by. We, we started with the, the Oresteia. So, you know, I mean, I'm writing something that's not Western, but my foundation is the very foundation of Western lit. Why is that? I think because the older I, the stories are, the further back I go is the more they were in common with different cultures. 
So we all have the flood myth. We all have the, the giant serpent eating its own tail. But I did want to tell a story where the whole sort of atmosphere would feel different. Were there key areas where it really diverged from the traditions that you had known before in the Western Well, traditions? one key area in which it diverged is that is the whole, our whole view on night and darkness and the connotations to that. We still connect dark with evil. We still kind of night with things done in secret. Things are going bump in the night. Ghosts come out at night. Vampires come out at night. None of that applies when you look at a lot of the African mythologies. Dark is actually a great time. Noon of the dead means the ancestors come out. It says something that in a lot of cases in the past few years when they're dealing with schizophrenia in the African continent, doctors are baffled because all the voices are positive. The idea of voices in your head in the African thing, it's the ancestors, it's people who mean you well. Here, it's you're crazy. Interesting. So I had to let go of all of that because that's, that's all the Western stuff. Even a simple thing like all the connotations that if I were to say to you the noon of the dead, you're probably thinking walking dead or whatever. All the connotations that just went off in your head, none would be relevant. Whereas if I say in broad daylight, you think, oh, that's when things are cool, that's when the sun is out, that's when things are brought to light. High noon is when all the monsters come out because they have no problem killing you in broad daylight. They want people to see that they can kill you. They want people to see their strength and their terror. So why would they hide in the night? Interesting. Yeah. Let's talk about the three books that you recommended that changed your life. Mm -hmm. um, you recommended the three books, Dog Eaters by Jessica Hagdorn, Shame by Salman Rushdie, and Sula by Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, I found all three of these books fascinating. Yeah. They were the kind of books that I wanted to slow down when I read mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. Which I do with them. all of them. Yeah, I read them very slowly. Let's first talk about Dog Eaters by Jessica Hagdorn. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-generational, multi-ethnic saga set in the Philippines and it traverses all socioeconomic groups. I think it interweaves rich and poor, violence and meekness, pop mm -hmm. culture, terrorism, and it's a little bit wild and, and really compelling. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what were you doing when you found this book? What was I doing? I was still in college, I think, when I found this book, and I was trying to be a writer. I've always read really widely, but I've rarely seen my country or myself certainly not the one i i know most of the books i've read at the time about jamaica look at it through a very nostalgic lens and while i could find tons of american novels that are set in a time period we're living in i couldn't find a lot of jamaican novels i couldn't find a lot of caribbean novels that were interested in a contemporary thing it's ironic because i still don't write contemporary novels but um so when i read dog eaters I thought this is the first time I'm seeing my own country thrown back at me, which is pretty remarkable because the novel is about the Philippines. <laughs> it's not about Jamaica at all, but it was a sh the shock of recognition was so strong. And I think there's a lot of things. One, it's the way in which politics has infiltrated everything. It's the way in which corruption has infiltrated everything. It's the way in which despite politics and corruption, there's a, there's sort of a funky, a funky beat to it. It's the how, if you look closely, all different types of society, whether it's straight, queer, weird, trans, and so on, are there, but they all figure out how to sort of subsume themselves into this national fabric. And also that if you're in a country like Philippines, if you're in a city like Manila or like Kingston or so on, there's always either a political election or a beauty contest. And, and sometimes you can't tell which is which. So it was, I just couldn't, I, I've never gotten over it. I've never gotten over that a book that's set thousands of miles away from where I grew up is where I saw myself. Have you ever been there? I've never been there, but I did meet Jessica Hagedorn. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've never been to the Philippines, and I just felt like I was dropped in this, mm -hmm. you know, telenovela with all the layers yeah. and... But that's what I like about the, this kind of book, I, and I like that you brought up telenovela because you can be a general, you can be a genre snob and write dog eaters, because you're gonna write two thirds of it with contempt. Yeah, you know, so like for example, I flipping love soap operas. And it's funny because I'm not devoted to any, but if you if it's two in the afternoon and the TV's on, 
I'll sit there till seven in the night and I'll watch all of them. I don't know the difference between General Hospital and Guiding Light, <laughs> but I know them, don't I? But it's it's the same thing. It's and and that's the other thing that I saw in this because before I read Dog Eaters, I still had a very snobbish attitude to literature because even though there is all this stuff I love, I was there are all these things that I all these ways in which I should write. Yeah. So pop culture can't be in it. All the stuff that I personally get joy out of can't be in literature. It must read like George Eliot. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I remember just as an English major, you're mm-hmm. sort of indoctrinated into mm. this idea of this is what you should read. This mm. is how you should write. I think when we started Goodreads, I started reading more and more genre mm-hmm. literature. And I think the longer I got in it, the less of a, a snob I became. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you read a, a romance book and... They're page turners. Mm. I mean, they know they know something about telling stories. They know something so about read... craft. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they, to, to, to bring it back to Dog Eaters, it, that sort of, oh, you have to love nearly everything. You have to love the pop. You have to love the junk. You have to love all of it and, and write all of it with equal love. It was just so more than refreshing. It was a way to write. And yeah. I think that's it. That's the one thing these all books have in common. It showed me a way to write. So let's talk a little bit about shame, which also to me seemed to show the crazy mixed up world that's a byproduct of colonialism, which Mm -hmm. is an area I like to read about. Um, So you recommended Shame by Salman Rushdie. Mm -hmm. And um, do you want to describe what it's about? If I knew what it's about, I could have (laughs) read it four times and I still can't say it. uh, You know, it's about about these three sisters, Chuni, Muni, and Bunny who quite mysteriously end up producing a child. And we don't know who, who, whose child it is. And from there, this child grows up into being, in a lot of ways, a manifestation of the whole disappointment of the failed independent Indian, Pakistani, whatever states. And despite the fact that it's surrounded by people who in their own ways have failed themselves and their country, the, the, the emotion of shame is banned. You're not you're allowed to experience shame. So what happens in the novel is that the collective shame of the whole country becomes so acute, it becomes its own person, and the consequences are just devastating. That doesn't sound like it's funny, but it's actually really funny. Well, I was going to say, I have to admit, I'd never read Salman Rushdie before, mm-hmm. and with a title like Shame, I didn't think it was going to be laugh out loud funny, mm-hmm. and I was cracking up. I was I'm- dying. <laughs> so I read this book when I was in church. So uh, in, in <laughs> church, in church, you have these leather-bound Bibles that's actually its own sort of case, so nobody really knows if you're actually reading your Bible or not. And I'd have it, and I'd have shame on, on right in the, there, and and you know, and, and uh, you know, my church could be really apocalyptic. You know, it'd be like. We're all going to hell, and I'm going ha <laughs> because I'm reading shame. Yeah, it was it was a friend of mine read the type of prose I used to write before I read shame, and he says you should read this book. And when I read it, and and I've since spoken to to Rushdie about it, is I'm amazed that he takes some of the conventions of colonial English and turn it on its head, like verbosity. It's a very verbose book, and it's deliberately so because he's also poking fun at verbosity and, and colonial English and all of that, which I just never knew I could laugh at. I also I thought it was really interesting that he said, is history to be considered the property of the participants solely? Mm-hmm. And I read that quote and I, I paused because I think it's such an interesting concept right now mm-hmm. where there's a lot of questions about ownership. We see that with writers who... If you're not writing about something that you have some sort of ownership of, Mm -hmm. some people are very critical of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it strikes me as something that can verge into dangerous territory if Mm -hmm. it becomes censorship. You know, how do you think we walk that line? I think I think the whole idea of censorship is seriously overblown. I think there's a big difference between me, me stomping on your right to express yourself and me blocking your avenues to making money. Hmm. And I think a lot of times what people are saying is, I'm being censored. And I'm not being no, I'm not censoring you. I'm just standing in the way you making a book, hmm. because it's it's we need to talk about failures of empathy. Yes. I was talking at a reading last night about about Heart of Darkness, which you know people still have issues with. And the thing about Heart of Darkness is, it's 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 crucial flaw and it's a fatal flaw, even though it's a brilliant book. 
its fatal flaw is, and I'm quoting, paraphrasing Jane Smiley, she wrote an essay in 1813 years of looking at the novel. So it's like, instead of reflecting or embodying or even observing a character, Conrad just projects his fears and desires on them and react to it. Yeah. And we don't realize how many times we do that. But, it, but if you want to see that, just look at how almost any post-war writer wrote women. I would make a wild guess and go 90% of those women aren't women. They're projections of fears and desire that they react to. So they're always harridans. They're always oversexed or undersexed. It's like when, you remember that, I don't even remember this hilarious meme that came out years ago, where, a, a year ago, where they, women writers wrote men the way men write women. Oh my God, amazing. <laughs> I, need, I need to find that. That's and I need and, and just say, because it, it would be like, Chuck wasn't what you'd call an attractive man. <laughs> But his dedication to his work made him appealing in a certain light. Uh, that's not a man. That's a no. projection of your fears and desires that you've reacted to. And that is, uh, that is a sizable percentage of anybody declared other. Women, black men, black women, Asians. Don't get me started on people write Asians. Absolutely. You know, we need to talk about novels that didn't get it right. Yeah. I know as a reader, you know, sometimes... You know, as a woman, you'll read a book that has been lauded, mm -hmm. and then there'll be the female character, and you think, this isn't believable. Yeah. You know, and it's it's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. as, and then you have other people like Tolstoy, who wrote mm -hmm. Anna Karenina, and I, I still can't believe that was mm -hmm. written by a man. I mean, so this is, this is, I'm glad you brought up Tolstoy, because one of the excuses we use for some of these books, like Heart of Darkness, is that it was off its time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. As I... So you're saying sexist portrayal of women of his time, how you explain Anna Karenina? Um, if racist portrayal of black people of his time, how you explain Benito Serino? Hell, how do you explain Othello? Yeah. Um, that there are, there are writers even going back hundreds of hundreds of years who did the work. Let's So let's move on to Sula, mm. <clears throat> which I stayed up almost the whole night trying to finish. Um, ah. And I hadn't read her since college, so it was really exciting. What was the one you read in college? I read The Blue, the Bluest, Bluest Eye, Eye. Mm -hmm. and I read Beloved. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was such a treat to get an invitation to go back and read more Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. What were you doing when you first read Sula? What I was doing was trying to figure out how to write woman. Because I was writing my first novel, Post Reading Shame. And a uh, writer read it and said, you know, you're a, you're a pretty good writer, but you don't have a clue about women. And I was like, what are you talking about? I know tons of women. I mean, I have a mother, you know, I have sisters. But then she asked me a question, which I also throw to people. And you're always surprised at the answer, which is how many women do you read? Yeah. And I could think of four all dead. And I said, that's your problem. That's you. You. There are things I cannot teach you about writing that reading one book will teach you. And not surprisingly, a lot of these really, really acclaimed writers who still suck at writing women don't read them. We did, so I have to tell you this, we mm -hmm. did a whole study on reading by gender a few mm -hmm. years ago, and we found that our male members, by and large, only read male authors. Mm -hmm. And the female readers read about half and half. But it was a really interesting study to see that because yeah. I would never have ever even mm. thought of it until I saw the numbers in front mm. of my face. I believe the numbers. So now that she sends me, she sends me on a reading mission. She says, who should you? I said, well, who should I read? She says, you need to read Sula and Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. So both novels usually end up on my best of all time list. It's a, the, the, she's the one to repeat author on the, on the list. But Sula, there's a scene in, in Sula where the title character, Sula, so Sula is a free spirit, and like a lot of free spirits, they leave a lot of destruction in their wake, including wrecking the marriage of her best friend. There's a very fine line between free and irresponsible, and she crosses it. Yes. And uh, it makes me dislike her, but it makes me like the book. Because I think, uh, you know, characters, characters need to surprise you, and characters need to disappoint you, like real people. Yeah. Yeah, and it's I think real. that yeah, that's when the, the novel becomes more real, even if I start to like the character less. So <laughs> Sula is now dying, and Nell finally con decides to confront her because Nell wants answers, including why did you do that? Why would you destroy our friendship like that? 
And Sula goes into a whole list of all the great things she has done. She says, I sure did live in this world and blah, blah, blah. And Nell says, well, what do you have to show for it? Which is such a it's a question we'd ask anybody. It's a question I would have asked Sula. It's a question I went, yeah, Sula, what do you have to show for it? You're dying alone. What do you have to show for it? And Sula says, show to who? And I don't have a lot of fall off the chair moments, but that was a fall off the chair moment because I was reading this book at a very, very bad time in my life. And the idea that I did not owe my life to anybody. My, my purpose here is not to meet people's approval or to continually win the favor of people who don't like me. It just, it just didn't occur to me. It didn't occur to me until I read this book. Nothing has changed my life more profoundly than that. those three words in that book. Do you think you immediately took that to heart? Immediately. I immediately took it to heart. I think it's responsible for nearly everything. I think it's responsible for the change in my life. I think it's responsible for me coming out of the church. I think it's responsible for me owning up to being gay. I think it's responsible for me writing the stories I want to write. It just was responsible for me realizing that I could take charge of my life and write myself to where I want to go. Well, I thought all three of these books were so whole and complicated and rich with all these different layers, which is a lot mm -hmm. like your books. Thank so you. thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you so much. The books we discussed today were Dog Eaters by Jessica Hagdorn, Shame by Salman Rushdie, and Sula by Toni Morrison. Marlon James is a creative writing professor at McAllister College in Minnesota. His latest novel is Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Books of Your Life is produced by me, Elizabeth, with Melissa Yeager-Miller, and with help from Danny Fakus and Sybil Wallace, with production help from Mark Atkinson. Our theme was composed by Mia Schettino. Audiobooks from Audible are a great way to get more books in your life. With the free Audible app, you can listen while commuting, doing chores, working out, anytime, anywhere, on any device. Audible's unmatched selection includes my guest, Marlon James' recommendation, Sula, by Toni Morrison. Get it free along with two selected Audible original titles when you start a 30-day trial or choose any other audiobook. To get started, just visit audible.com slash goodreads or text goodreads to 500500.